so you can start the the talk please the next talk thank you so much sir thank you uh, dr nazar for the kind invite and thank you dr binil paul rafael uh, as well uh, thank you dr venkat giri uh, and very uh, good evening to all the dignitaries dr chakra rao dr rashesh tiwan and all the uh, eminent team members of uh, iacf so beginning with the cpr code links uh, the indian research station council has given uh, various code links which are essential for the purpose of uh, uh, understanding basic aspect we do have algorithm which will be discussed in subsequent sessions also but then uh, each uh, algorithm the basic concept has been put in the form of code links for the resuscitation aspect now basic uh, purpose for putting these uh, links was uh to look for which are the main core components that would improve the outcome of the cpr and these are primarily the metamorphical depiction of series of critical actions the most essential actions which are required for management of cardiac arrest victims so knowing understanding and then subsequently appropriately executing these uh, interdependent keys which uh, we have labeled as links uh, they have uh, have an important impact on the overall outcome of resuscitation and hence uh, these uh, links becomes important to understand when we talk about the lay person uh, resuscitation which is compression on the life support the three essential components has been mentioned as the code links the first one remains the early recognition and activation because uh, as dr chakra was also mentioning that time is an essence it's just not minutes maybe seconds also so we need to recognize uh, the the cardiac arrest victims and initiate the process of uh, shifting these patients to the nearest hospital while this is being done these patients should be provided chest compression which is the uh, best skill that can be provided by a lay person as compared to the other things like provision of breath etc and that's why the lay person cpr the core link remains restricted to the early good quality chest compression and then obviously they need definitely the comprehensive care and hence these needs to be shifted at the earliest to the nearest hospital where they can provide uh, the comprehensive cardiopulmonary life support so these all three code links has been translated into a stepwise approach which is uh, basically the cls algorithm and this algorithm primarily talks about uh, looking for the scene safety and checking for the response and based on this whether the patient is responsive or non responsive in responsive the patient has momentarily uh, loss of consciousness so they probably has underlying cause they need to be observed and shear, uh, shift to the nearest facility but if there's uh, non responsive the adult witnessed cardiac arrest most commonly it will be a cardiac cause and hence these patients would require chest compression for lay person it's just a chest compression a good quality chest compression five cycles of 30 chest compression each without interruption and then subsequently they need to have check for response which is in the form of a movement of the patient coughing or vocalizing and based on this if they respond this means he has a turn of spontaneous circulation needs to be observed shifted to the hospital in case they are non responsive the five sets of 30 catches compressions needs to be continued till we get further help so this is what the basic uh, uh, concept is for lay person cpr now coming uh, to the second aspect of uh, the resuscitation which is uh, cpr when it is provided outside the hospital that is the basic cardiopulmonary life support whether they are by a trained personnel because the resuscitation outside hospital has limitations of various infrastructure drugs and other equipments and hence this dedicated uh, guideline of bcls becomes important at this point of time now when we talk of uh, the core links for the adult bcls uh, since these are trained personnels apart from the early recognition and activation the early high quality cpr which includes not just the chest compression but the breathing aspect also and the early defibrillation because these may be the paramedical personnels who are well trained in providing defibrillation and as we know that the most common cause of uh, cardiac arrest in adult victims is arrhythmias so early defibrillation would be a good option for them and obviously they need to be shifted so this means what we have added for adult bcls is early high quality cpr which is inclusive of taking care of the airway and breathing and then the early defibrillation because the 
majority of time, the reason for cardiac arrest is arrhythmias and defibrillation remains the treatment of choice and it needs to be done at the earliest. And obviously, since the things are happening outside the hospital, they need to be shifted to the nearest hospital so that a comprehensive cardiopulmonary life support can be provided to these patients. The underlying disease that has led to cardiac arrest can be taken care of and the patients can be treated for whatever the pathology which has led to the cardiac arrest can be treated at the earliest. Again, uh, these basic concepts, these four links is uh, translated into a stepwise algorithmic approach. And uh, starting from the scene safety and checking for the rhythm, uh, the other things uh, which, which includes the management of these patients uh, remains uh, important. And this is checking for the response. If responsive, this means the patient have transient loss of consciousness and needs to be observed and shifted to the hospital. But if they are non-responsive, then it becomes an emergency. Uh, the help needs to be rendered here. And since these are trained personals, they need to check for the breathing and the carotid pulse also. The, when the pulse and the breathing is being checked, it should not be more than for five to 10 seconds. And in this situation, three options can appear. The patient is having a normal breath with definite pulse. The patient is non-responsive, maybe some neurological reason. They need to be uh, in recovery position and they need to be reassessed quite frequently. In case if they are having no breath or abnormal breath, then these patients would be provided one breath only every five seconds. This is a little different when you talk of breath with in, inside the hospital setting uh, without uh, the pulses. It will be a little different, will come a little later. In case both are absent, the chest compressions and the breath both needs to be started. And five cycles of 30 chest compressions and two breath needs to be administered to these patients. After five cycles, you need to check for the carotid pulse. And based on this, you can take subsequent steps. Now, this is the scenario which will be more commonly uh, available for majority of uh, persons, even by <coughs> trained personals outside the hospital. And hence, this basic uh, thing you must see here that doesn't require much of the infrastructure. But moment the help arrives uh, in the form of defibrillator, uh, these patients uh, need to be attached with the defibrillator or if the AED is available, they can use uh, AED also. Uh, many of the ambulances has AED and some of the ambulances are defibrillator. So whatever the options available, use them at the earliest so that the shockable rhythm can be given defibrillation, uh, electrical therapy that will convert an arrhythmia into a normal sinus rhythm. Based on this, uh, uh, you need to remember that if you are using defibrillator, the Indian Resuscitation Council has uh, kept this initial energy as 120 joules rather than 200 joules, as the requirement is a little less in Indian population. And once the shock has been given, you need not to check for the pulse. At this point of time, just after giving shock, give five cycles of 30 chest compression and two breaths without interruption. And this cycle would go on if the patient has return of spontaneous circulation or a help has been rendered, the patient needs to be shifted to the nearest hospital. So this is uh, what we have talked about uh, the BCLS aspect, uh, which is one of the uh, no, important aspect of providing resuscitation by a trained personnel outside the hospital in the restricted environment because the infrastructure may not be as same as inside the hospital. So this was the overview of uh, the uh, both the components uh, of uh, COLS and BCLS. Uh, let's come to the uh, our core uh, topic for the day. Uh, if uh, uh, Dr. Nazar permits, I think uh, if he allows me, uh, can I continue with my next session for CCLS also? Yes, sir, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, coming to the next session, uh, which is about the uh, comprehensive cardiopulmonary life support. So continuing with this, uh, since it is a comprehensive resuscitation process, so there are components which are very essential and they have been put in the form of five essential core links. Now these five uh, essential core links is, uh, the first core link is important. Uh, just not the early recognition, which is paramount as we have been discussing, the time is an essence 
enhance early recognition and initiation of the resuscitation activity is very, very important because with each minute that passes by, the chances of <coughs> uh, recovery reduces by almost 7 to 10 percent, and hence it becomes that each second is important. Simultaneously, it is <coughs> also important <coughs> Uh, to look for the uh, pre-arrest conditions because majority of these patients would have some underlying pathology. Maybe uh, those patients who are admitted, they may have uh, renal disease, they may have liver disease, they may have sepsis, they may have any uh, glucose-related issues, uh, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. So these are all the pre-arrest conditions and uh, the pre-arrest conditions will also manifest in some, of, some form of the cardiac changes. They will have some type of arrhythmias which are uh, uh, which will be manifested because of these uh, metabolic electrolyte or other changes. So these needs to be picked up at the earliest and managed before these patients go into frank cardiac arrest. Now, once uh, the recognition has been done or the the uh, patients uh, is being managed or being optimized for the underlying disease in case if they have cardiac arrest, uh, we need to just not recognize it, but we need to activate the code blue tip. It has been variously labeled in the hospital as code view team or local team or CPR team, whatever the team is, they need to be activated so that the infrastructure and the manpower could be brought at the point where the patient is being resuscitated so that the patient gets some comprehensive care since it is happening inside the hospital. The early high quality CPR remains one of the important mandate. And as I talked earlier in the BCLS part, the early defibrillation because majority of time the adult cardiac arrest primarily is related to the cardiac disease and the most of the most of the commonest arrhythmias uh, in a cardiac arrested victim is uh, the treatment of choice remains defibrillation and hence the early attempt or the initiation of early defibrillation remains one of the important thing now once uh, the the uh, basic thing of uh, uh, the high quality CPR and early defibrillation is being done, we need to have early comprehensive life support, which includes other advanced things, including the definitive airway management, inclusion of the drugs or the other tools and techniques that would take care of the underlying pathology and try to improve the outcome of these patients. And also in case if they have return of spontaneous circulation, definitely there is an underlying disease that may take some time or that is being done. So these patients should receive post resuscitation care. And accordingly, if a patient needs dialysis, have electrolyte imbalance, they can go for dialysis. If patient is having a cardiac disease, uh, coronary artery disease, they may require a cardiologist's opinion for further management. So this, uh, these four core links that I've just mentioned uh, remains the essential component to understand. And uh, we, should, we shall be uh, you know, interacting with how these can be translated into uh, algorithmic approach so that each code link is being depicted in this stepwise approach of CCLS so that the outcome of the patient becomes better. So this is uh, what I just talked about, uh, the overview of the code links, the essential key components of CPR in COLS, BCLS, and CCLS. So once uh, we can understand these concepts, we can easily take care of the various aspects that we have just discussed. So let me take you through now the CCLS aspect. Uh, I just mentioned about uh, that the algorithmic approach would be required for these patients. So when we talk about the CCLS, So in CCLS also, uh, uh, when we talk about this algorithm, which is uh, the translation of the code links into a stepwise approach, let's see how if a patient gets in cardiac arrest inside the hospital, what basic steps needs to be taken care of. Now, the scene safety is an important aspect that needs to be remembered because these patients sometimes can have cardiac arrest in uh, a situation like they are, they are being shifted to from one place to other. There could be an emergency situation in the emergency ward where sometimes the scene may not be so safe. And hence, it becomes essential to ensure the safety of the rescuer as well as the patient at the place where the resuscitation is being done. Once the safety has been ensured, the next step remains checking for the response. For checking the response, come from the front side of the patient and tap, tap on the shoulder on both the sides and ask loudly. 
So this is just not an audio response or a verbal response, but it is also a tactile response. So you have to tap on the shoulder and speak loudly in a language which patient can understand. You can introduce yourself and ask, are you all right? And based on this, the patient response uh, or patient remains non-responsive. So based on this, you can take subsequent uh, uh, strategies for management of these patients. Now, in case if the patient uh, is responsive, this means the patient has transient loss of consciousness. That could be a visual syncope or could be related to other metabolic disease, but he has recovered spontaneously. So still these patients should require uh, assessment of the underlying disease that has led to this uh, transient loss of consciousness and hence uh, assess for the cause and manage them accordingly and simultaneously monitor the patient because these patients can go into cardiac arrest. And hence, this is very, very important that this patient should not be left alone. They need to be monitored. They need to be assessed so that they are not being landed up into a patient in the phase of non-responsive. And this is what we're talking about, the pre-arrest conditions that needs to be identified. And these are the patients who probably show a warning sign of these pre-arrest pre conditions and hence needs aggressive and intensive uh, assessment and monitoring for these patients so that these patients have normal uh, rhythms. Now, on the other aspect, if the patient do not respond in any verbal or uh, uh, the physical movement of the body and the patient remains non-responsive, we need to activate the code beauty. Now, it becomes very important, depends upon the area where the cardiac arrest has happened. It could be in setup like an intensive care unit, which is fully functional, which is fully equipped, which has uh, uh, appropriate number of manpower for providing resuscitation. So it will be just uh, you know, getting the person and the equipment, that is the crash cart, on the site of the ICU bed. But there could be situations uh, wherein the ward, uh, which will be a big ward, uh, the crash cart would be at other places, or there may not be sufficient manpower for providing a team dynamics of providing CCLS. In those things, uh, we need to activate uh, the code blue team or the local team and ensure or inform them that they need to get a car crash cart, which has uh, various equipments related to the airway management. That is definitely airway management. They have uh, various things, various trucks that are required for resuscitation. And also, uh, uh, nevertheless, to say that the defibrillator must be uh, no, asked for in this situation because it has to be given at the earliest. Also ensure that uh, uh, the other aspects that would be required for assessing these patients should also be uh, asked at this point of time when you are activating the code blue team. Once the team has been activated, the, the rescuer, whosoever is available at that point of time, should immediately proceed with the next step while the uh, team is being approached and the crash cart and the defibrillator is being brought to the site where the patient has a cardiac arrest inside the hospital. This rescuer should check the breathing while palpating the carotid pulse. This means that the breathing and the pulse check needs to be done simultaneously. If you see in this figure, you can easily see that uh, the rescuer is stabilizing the airway and simultaneously he is checking the carotid pulse. His eyes are looking on the chest to look for the normal chest movements so that he can ensure that the patient is appropriately breathing. So this means breathing and pulse check by carotid needs to be done simultaneously. But remember that time is an essence and we mentioned that both the things should be done within 10 seconds, but at least for five seconds also. So you should take at least five to 10 seconds for seeing the breathing and pulse in these patients. Now, how to check for the pulse? We, you, you all will be having a practical session that how to check for the pulse and breathing in these patients. Uh, that is the carotid pulse, which is the only pulse in the adults that needs to be checked in a non-responsive patient. How to check it? I uh, will discuss and show you and demonstrate you more in the uh, hands-on practice that we'll be doing uh, tomorrow and you will uh, see that how the things have done. But remember that uh, uh, this is as per the time. So for ensuring that you are taking appropriate time, not too less, not too more, 
you can chant 1001, 1000 through, 1003 till 1010. This approximately take one second for each uh, numerical and approximately you will not be losing time. Now, based on this, uh, three situations can happen. The first situation, patient is not responsive, but is having normal breathing with definite carotid pulse. So this means there is some underlying disease that patient is non-responsive, maybe a neurological uh, uh, reason, maybe a metabolic disease affecting the neurological condition. And hence, uh, the things are being evaluated. They need to be reassessed and for the underlying cause and subsequently the management accordingly. But then simultaneously, because the patient is having some underlying disease which has leads to unconsciousness and sometimes they can proceed with uh, some cardiac arrhythmias or cardiac arrest also or respiratory issues. These needs to be monitored and assessed every two minutes. The second situation could be that the patient is having abnormal breathing or no, not normal breathing, but having a definite carotid pulse. This means the patient is having only the respiratory uh, concerns, uh, but the, the pulse is uh, uh, appropriately being fed. This could be because of various metabolic issues. This may be because of drug toxicity. So till the uh, respiratory efforts comes up, patient has to be supplemented with uh, the breathing strategies. So these patients may be provided one breath every five seconds using a bag and mask ventilation. So since this is inside the hospital, we are not talking about mouth to mouth or mouth to mask. Each hospital must be having bag mask ventilation, bag and mask availability, and hence these needs to be delivered with bag and mask ventilation. Now, the point to note here is that we are saying one breath every five seconds. So this means approximately 12 breaths a minute. Since this patient is having carotid pulse, the metabolism may be normal. So these patients may require a little more oxygen and hence the number of breaths are a little higher, that is 12. Uh, you will see that subsequently I'll be talking that in patients who are having cardio respiratory arrest, the metabolism goes down and that's why uh, since the uh, cardiac uh, compression remains a priority, we decrease the number of breaths in those patients, which is approximately uh, uh, lesser number of breaths once uh, we are not talking about cycles and I'll be discussing a little later. Also remember, even in this case, when the patient is having no breathing or abnormal breathing, but with pulse, you need to look for the underlying cause for it. And if a patient is a opiate overdose, you can reverse it naloxone. If there is some other metabolic issues, try to correct them. The third situation could be the patient is having abnormal or no breathing without a definite carotid pulse. This means you need to provide this patient not only breath, but a manual chest compression. And hence, cycles of 30 chest compressions and two breath is warranted in this group of patients. Um, we'll be discussing about how to give breaths uh, again in the hands-on session that you'll be having tomorrow. And you'll be learning how to hold a mask and how to provide a rescue breaths. Further techniques will be again, we'll be having a separate session today itself, and we'll be discussing this in detail there. So once this has been done, you will start with the 30 compressions and uh, 30 compressions and two breath. Now for providing the chest compression, you need to identify the correct placement of your hand and you need to maintain the good quality of chest compression. Now for identifying, again, we'll be showing you tomorrow how to identify this place and provide a good chest compression, a good quality chest compression. So identify the lowest end of the zephoid process. Keep the two fingers, as you can see in this picture, and keep heel of the hand over the two fingers that you have identified, and keep the other heel over the first one and interlock the fingers. And show that the fingers are not touching the chest and heel is absolutely in the center that is over the sternum. And you start, uh, uh, once you identified this place, you position yourself so that you are your um, shoulder, elbows, and this are the straight line, and you are putting pressures from the shoulders rather than the wrist. Now, for the chest compression, you need to ensure that you are pressing at least five to six centimeters at a speed of 120 compressions per minute. This means when I say 30 compressions, this means it should take approximately 15 seconds. Or another way, I can say that each second you need to compress the chest twice. Once you compress the chest, you need to allow them to recoil also so that the uh, the venous return happens and the cardiac filling occurs. You should not be stopping chest compressions because uh, 
if you stop in between, uh, the corneal perfusion pressures goes down and the patient uh, uh, may not get good uh, perfusion and hence the chances of recovery becomes less. And hence this becomes very, very important as a part of good quality chest compression that you should continue chest compressions without unnecessary interruption. Also count, uh, count loudly one, two, three uh, till 30 because uh, it's a team dynamics and the other person should know also that uh, how much is the count so that once you are just able to uh, complete the 30 sets, the other person is ready without wasting time because each second is important. The chest compression is uh, one of the important aspects uh, which requires a lot of uh, energy and efforts. And it has been seen that the rescuer fatigue happens with the chest compression. And hence, if uh, other persons are available, it is always a good idea that after five cycles, one should interchange for the chest compression. The breath should be provided using baggage mask ventilation, each breath over one second and pose for one second. And after the second breath, don't pose for, don't uh, wait for the expiration to happen. Immediately start chest compression. How to provide? Again, we have a session today itself, uh, uh, subsequently in which uh, details can be seen there. Now, once this uh, five cycles of 30 chest compression and two breath has been delivered, it's a point, at this point, the patient needs to be reassessed. And since uh, it's, it's an uh, uh, trained uh, healthcare workers, you need to check for the carotid pulse as we have discussed earlier for five to 10 seconds. There's no need to check for the breathing here uh, because the pulse uh, needs to be checked only uh, for five to 10 seconds. And the, the, the plan of uh, assessment remains, uh, uh, the assessment remains uh, in the same as we have done earlier. So in case pulse is present, so this means uh, you have successfully have return of spontaneous circulation. So you can go into the second limb, which we have discussed earlier with no breathing, check for the breathing. If the patient even had breathing, this means the patient uh, have both the things. Uh, you need to monitor the patient, treat the underlying cause and try to look for subsequent management. But in case the pulse is absent, you continue with another five cycles of 30 chest compressions and two breaths. Now these cycles will go on. Now, depending upon the infrastructure that you have, I think uh, at this point of time, not much of infrastructure has been uh, uh, no, demanded at this point of time, and it can be done at any part of the hospital without any concern. Now, moment the, the, the activation that has been done earlier, uh, the other crash cart and the, the defibrillator would be made available. So once it is made available in that situation, you try to follow the defibrillation protocols for these patients. And let's see how it can be done. So once it is available, you attach the defibrillator pads. In case if it is adhesive pads, attach them. In case if you are using pedals, you can you need to attach them appropriately. But remember, while this is being done, the chest compression needs to be continued. Once they has been attached and the rhythm has been analyzed, at that point, no, nobody should be touching the patient because that can create artifacts and the patient uh, and these artifacts may confuse whether it's arrhythmias or it is artifacts because of the movement. Now, based on this assessment, the rhythm could be shockable or not shockable. Shockable rhythms are usually the ventricular fibrillations and pulseless ventricular tachycardia and arrested victim. Non-shockables, ACSD and PA. Uh, PA, this means you will have some organized rhythm on your monitor, but you will not be able to feel for the pulse. So at this point of time, especially to differentiate between normal sinus rhythm and pulseless electrical activity, carotid pulse needs to be done. In case if it's asystole, you follow the flatline protocol uh, because uh, it does not the, uh, the pathology in the uh, electrical conduction, but it could be the other uh, concerns like the, uh, the ECG lead not appropriate or the gain is not appropriate or the selection is on your different is not appropriate or is a fine VF. So it may be misinterpreted as ACE display, but it could be other rhythms. And hence, this flatline protocol needs to be followed for these patients. So it is, if it is shockable, uh, give one shock, start with 120 joules and you can escalate further. But in case uh, at some places, even the aid is available, if yes, it is available, it is an auto-selected one. And remember, after giving shock, there is no need to check for any rhythm or a pulse. Immediately, five cycles of 30 chest compressions and two breaths needs to be delivered and ensure that the high quality CPR is being maintained. If it is non-shockable rhythm, no shock is required, resume CPR and then continue five cycles of 30 compressions and two breaths. 
Now, this is what we have talked about the increasing availability of the infrastructure. So we talked initially wherein you're providing 30 compressions and two breaths, then you had a day fib. And by the time you're, you've already summoned for the crash cart and the other things becomes available. So while the CPR is being ongoing, you can add on these subsequent uh, uh, comprehensive components, advanced components into your CPR uh, cycle so that the patient outcomes becomes better. The venous access is important. Uh, the, the preferred route is the intravenous access and show that you give the drugs followed them by boluses so that the drugs goes inside the body and goes to the heart where the manual compression is happening. It can go to the other places. In case if you are not able to secure intravenous routes uh, in two to three attempts, you can get ahead with intraosseous routes. Uh, even in adult, they work very fine. And the tibia remains one of the acceptable modality of the bone where the interosseous roots can be done. As a rescue measure, uh, as a respirate measure, uh, you can look for the endotechial route, but remember the drug requirements are almost two to two and a half times. Now, in case if the expertise are available, and you think of the airway management in these patients, uh, the advanced airway management, what, how, and at what is the endpoint for this airway management, we'll be having a session today itself. The drugs uh, are important aspect of uh, resuscitation. So the adrenaline remains one of the important drugs in patients with cardiac arrest. You give one milligram of the adrenaline diluted in tenamel solution, and it needs to be repeated every three to five minutes. And it should be given while the chest compression is ongoing so that it gets distributed appropriately to the receptors and hence will bring about its effect. In case if you are doing CPR and even after two to three sets of five cycles of CPR, the arrhythmia has persist, then it's a time to give antiarrhythmics. Amadone remains the drug of choice, 300 milligram, slow intravenous needs to be given. If the arrhythmia still persists after a couple of more cycles, a second dose may be repeated. In case amadone is not available, the alternate drug, uh, lignocaine or lidocaine can also be used in patients who are having persistent arrhythmias. Also, you need to remember, uh, as we mentioned in the beginning also, these patients probably would have underlying pathology that has led to cardiac arrest. CPR is a, is a process where you buy time and try to have return of spontaneous circulation while the underlying disease is being managed. And hence, it becomes very, very important that you need to look for the causes of the pathology which are reversible and hence try to you know, find them, assess them while the CPR is going on. Look for the records look for the investigation, send the blood investigations, get the history done, get the history from the files or the patient patient attendants and try to look for what is the possible reason. Maybe uh, uh, the patient of CRF, hyperkalemia, cardiac arrest needs to be treated. Hypoglycemia, diabetic patients, hyperglycemia needs to be treated. And hence this needs to be done. And it has been seen in the Indian population that uh, this mnemonic hit the target. So these are the uh, uh, various uh, causes that needs to be assessed while the CPR is being ongoing. So one rescuer should look for all those causes from various things, from the files, from the records, from the patient attendance, and by sending the samples, blood samples, or use of ultrasonography at point of time, so that these causes can be ruled out. And simultaneously, whatever the causes come out, for example, trauma patients, hypovolemia, they need to be fluid resuscitated. So these needs to be treated as and when you find a, any uh, abnormality in the patient have a proper history, physical examination, review the records and manage them as and when they appear uh, into your uh, treatment modality. And sure, uh, while CPR, a good quality uh, CPR is important and we'll be discussing more into your hands-on session that what do you mean by good quality CPR? Whatever I have discussed till now, uh, all those norms needs to be ensured, needs to be followed so that you get good quality and the patient chances of recovery becomes much better. These are with regards to chest compression, with regards to ventilation, with regards to airway management. Uh, there are various uh, quality assessment tools and measures that needs to be assessed and followed so that these patients get a good quality CPR. Now, in case the patient is revived with signs of circulation, that is return of spontaneous circulation, these patients should go for post-resuscitation care. As I mentioned, some of these underlying disease, the patient would require intervention in the post-resuscitation period. And hence, these patients would require just not the intensive monitoring, further assessment, maybe evasing, maybe blood test, but sometimes uh, these patients may require interventions uh, from the cardiologist's point of view or a dialysis or something like this, and hence these patients should receive post-resuscitation care. So this is uh, what we have uh, covered with regards to the, uh, the comprehensive cardiopulmonary life support. 
and when we perform the uh, chorus of CCLS, a team dynamics is required. And again, today we'll be having an excellent session a little later where the team dynamics would be talked up at how efficiently these all multiple steps that we just discussed of the CCLS can be given to the patients for a good outcome. So thank you so much. And uh, uh, we are open for any questions or comments from any of us. Thank you so much. Dr. Nasser? Yeah, sir, please unmute Nasser, sir. Ajilil? Hey, yeah, yeah. Next is the Dr. Bilge. There is some no. audio pr problem. Uh, it is clear here, no problem, sir. Next, I invite uh, Dr. Bilge. He's a, a, a assistant professor of MES Medical College, Irindal Marna. And uh, he's a president of ISM Alapra City branch. He'll be giving talk on basic and advanced airway. Dr. Bridges, please start. Dr. Bridges? Yes, sir. Hello. We invite is talking on basic and advanced airway. He is the consultant uh, and, and, and series at MS Medical College, uh, Perindalbana, and he is the current uh, president of uh, ISA Malapuram City Branch. Over to Dr. Vijesh Rebivarma. Dr. Vijesh, please. Yes. Dr. Vijesh? Yeah. Okay. Am I audible, sir? Yes, 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 yes. You are clear. You are clear. Is please, my... please proceed. Yes. So good evening all. So I am as a individual and as a president of the Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, Malapuram City Bands. I'm very happy to be a part of this mega program and uh, very few of the stalwarts of Indian resuscitation scenario are there with us to support us, to guide us and uh, to be with us. So uh, without wasting much time, let me go to the topic proper. So we are with CCLS, Comprehensive Cardiopulmonary Life Support. And uh, we know it is by the trained personnel inside the hospital. So we know this is the, uh, uh, the total guideline, which is marked with blue. And the, uh, my topic is regarding the airway management. So airway management, what are the various scenarios that top that can happen in a hospital. So different scenarios can include a previous situation in the, from the ward or the emergency department. Okay, somebody is not breathing well or somebody is going hypoxic, somebody's saturation is dropping, or it can be an activation of code blue anywhere in the hospital with uh, no airway management which has been done or activation of code blue has already occurred and somebody is uh, bagging the patient and uh, now you are as an expert in CCLS are coming to the screen. So what are you supposed to do? So that is the question. So in the CCLS guidelines, we have two places principally where breathing comes into, I must admit that the breathing and the airway management takes a back seat. That, that point we will discuss later. And uh, these are the first, first place where the breathing and the airway management comes is where initial response check where, uh, where you have either a normal breath with a normal pulse or an no breathing with a pulse or no breathing and no pulse. So that we have discussed in BCLS also. Or in advanced CCLS, somewhere during resuscitation, if equipments and uh, expertise is available, we have a proper definitive airway management. So basic airway management consists of, so two parts are there in the airway management in CCLS. One is basic airway management and the other is the advanced airway management. Basic airway management includes the manual relief of upper airway obstruction using the triple manual 
bag and mask ventilation and the insertion of oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway healthcare professionals as we are all should be well with the basic airway management as it is crucial for maintaining airway patency and providing breaths so how will we start with basic airway management so first thing is opening up an obstructed airway so you use the technique so the most common cause of airway obstruction is a fall and come and we open it up with a procedure called as head tilt and chin lift i'm sure all of you have learned these techniques when you were attending the bcls class so this is just a revision head tilt with your uh, ha one hand and chin lift with your other hand so thereby you remove the tongue from obstructing the airway so for, how do you do a head tilt chin lift maneuver with following these steps with the patient so find position yourself beside the patient's head place heel of one hand on forehead apply a firm backward pressure with palm place fingertips of the other hand under the lower jaw lift the chin upward with the entire lower jaw so this anyway we are going to do in the workshop uh, the coming day but do you do all these things every time no the when the you suspect some cervical spine fracture there is no head tilt allowed here you do jaw thrust and manual spinal motion restriction so what is this jaw thrust about so jaw thrust is the other maneuver especially when there is suspected cervical spine injury which uh, helps to open up the airway without moving the cervical spine so if uh, for, how do you do a jaw thrust maneuver follow these steps kneel above the patient head place your fingers behind the angles of the lower jaw move the jaw upwards and use your thumbs to help position the jaw all these things you have done in the bcls class and we will be doing again in the coming workshop and so you have opened up this airway with your triple man the head tilt chin lift jaw thrust everything and now we have to give breath so how do you give breath with an ambu bag and mask and to give effective breath so the air will go into the lungs air will go into the airway you should have a proper bag and mask and it should occlude your nose and mouth and you hold that mask with a c and e technique here you can see the c with the thumb and the index finger which presses down the mask onto the face and rest of the three fingers forming an e uh, pressing the jaw gently and lifting it up so that the tongue fall or the airway obstruction is relieved if you cannot do it with single hand you can do it with both the hands as shown in the picture so what do you do now so there is a bag and mask you give one when there is no uh, a cardiac arrest you give one breath every 5 seconds so this 12 breaths per minute one breath over one second and what is the end point of uh, properly given rescue breath visible chest rise it is said that a normal tidal volume breath should be provided that is what is so you uh, ascertain by c a visible chest rise now coming to basic airway adjuncts so far in uh, uh, calls or bcls we do not have used these airway adjuncts much now the gadgets which help to prevent the obstruction of tongue they are the basic airway adjuncts they include an oropharyngeal airway or a nasopharyngeal airway so these are the pictures of oropharyngeal airway and how do you you have to according to the size of the patient uh, you have to uh, measure the size from the midpoint of the incisors to the angle of the mandible and you have to choose the appropriate size of oral airway and insert it and uh, we are going to have a session on how to insert uh, the airway in the workshop you insert the oropharyngeal airway upside down twist 180 once inserted half way and the flange front end should sit just in front of the teeth okay now coming to the nasopharyngeal airway again this also bypasses the 
uh, obstruction of the tongue, as you can see in the figure here. So again, you have to choose the appropriate size of the nasopharyngeal airway. It is said that it should measure from the tragus of the ear to the lateral edge of the nostril. That is the proper size of nasopharyngeal airway for a particular person. We will avoid using nasopharyngeal airways, especially when there is severe head injury with blood in the nose, and if there is a history of fractured nose nasal bone. So it can migrate sometimes in the brain and cause complications. So we want to avoid that. Now, these are basic airway management. So you had the triple maneuver, which opened up the airway. Then you had the bag and mask ventilation. And now you had the airway adjuncts in the form of oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airway. Now coming to the uh, advanced airway management. So why do you use an advanced airway management? So for better and definitive control of oxygenation and ventilation, and also to protect the airway from aspiration of vomitus, secretions, blood, and gas. Definite airway can be deferred. It is not a no, but it can be deferred to a later time. So to prevent unnecessary interruption of chest compression in calls or VCLs or CCLs, chest compression is the most important thing. So you should not interrupt chest compression un unnecessarily. So even for uh, to obtain an advanced airway. In such cases, bag and mask ventilation should be continued till expert arrives. So experts in intubation, they may be able to do in a lesser amount of time. So that chest compression continues. Or there are certain other airway adjuncts, which is also included in the advanced airway, like supraglottic airway devices, like LMAs, IGELs. So the use of supraglottic devices is also advocated if rescuer is appropriately trained. So if you do not know how to use it, you don't use it. If it is appropriately trained and endotracheal tube placement is not feasible or successful, then you can use an airway adjunct like a supraglottic airway device. I'm sure we will have a session, practical session on insertion of supraglottic device coming day. I'm skipping through these slides because of uh, lack of time. We, and uh, we, these are the various steps involved in insertion of uh, supraglottic airway device, which we will see in the coming days. And the, the definite airway, we can, any, the gold standard of definite airway is endotracheal intubation. And the various equipments required for endotracheal intubation include laryngoscope, endotracheal tube, stillet, if, the, if proper guidance is required, a 10 ml syringe, suction catheter and machine, and tidal carbon dioxide detector. And uh, it's uh, a technique which you need expertise. So, and it's very important that your endotracheal tube has gone into trachea itself and not into the esophagus. So there are certain confirmatory, confirmatory positions where you can say that, okay, this tube is inside the trachea. So you have to question by direct vision where you see that endotracheal tube going into the glottis, past the glottis, or by point auscultation on uh, both axilla, on anterior, both anterior chest wall and in the epigastrium, and the clinical improvement of the patient. But the gold standard, everyone says, is capnography. A trace of the carbon dioxide, which is coming out of the lungs, which forms as a trace. And you see, it is your to trace. You say the endotracheal tube is in place. Again, we have an insertion technique or demonstration skill station coming up tomorrow. So I'm not going to the details of how to do an endotracheal intubation. We will be seeing that in the coming days. So in, in short, how will you remember the equipment required for endotracheal intubation? You can say uh, soap me. So what is soap me? Suction. S for suction, O for oxygenation, A for airway equipment, P for patient's positioning, the sniffing position, M for monitors, 
and E for esophageal detection device. And it is not uh, just that we need these equipments, you should arrange them properly and you should assure that they are functioning properly. So checking their function also is very important when you have your hospital with facilities for CCMA. And in cases, in many, many hospitals have different extra equipments for managing difficult airways. I'm just showing this picture, that's all. So different persons will have different sort of such equipments. And we said about uh, one P, patient positioning. So this proper positioning of uh, airway, proper positioning of the head and neck is important when you intubate. So some head neck flexed at 25 to 35 degrees and head extended at the plantar occipital joint to some around 85 degrees is the optimal position where when you do the laryngoscopy, you can see the glottic inlet. This is called sniffing position. And uh, these are pictures showing how to do an endotracheal intubation. So this is better seen directly rather than seen on the screen. So I'm skipping that. And what are the drugs which will aid endotracheal intubation during resuscitation? So patient is in near cardiac arrest or has already arrested. So the condition of the heart is not that good. So in them, the usual induction agents which we use may not be appropriate, which will all which will further depress the myocardium. So midazolam or midazolam with fentanyl or ketamine may be better choices here. And if needed, if needed, sometimes we you may not need. If needed, you can use succinylcholine. The other drug which we suggest is opronin with sugamidex. And if a patient who is already intubated suddenly deteriorates, what are the possible diagnoses? You can call it as dope. So in your hospital, you have already intubated and you're happy. Suddenly patient deteriorates. What, is, what are the possibilities? One, D. D for displacement of tube. O for obstruction of the tube. P for pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, pulselessness. Suddenly patient went for cardiac arrest again or equipment failure, like there is no oxygen or a disconnected tube or a ventilator failure. Like So if an intubated patient suddenly deteriorates, think about dope, displacement, obstruction, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, pulselessness, or equipment failures. A word about end-tidal capnography in resuscitation. So monitor end-tidal capnography if available. It is the gold standard for proper placement of an endotracheal tube. If less than 10 millimeters of mercury, then CPR quality is inadequate and needs improvement. So it's a, it's a directive, okay? Your CPR is not that of good quality. And restoration of spontaneous circulation is indicated during CPR. So you are doing CPR and suddenly the heart starts pumping again, restoration of spontaneous circulation happens. So how do you stop, find out a sudden increase in the entidal carbon dioxide? So blood starts flowing to the lungs, carbon dioxide starts coming out of the lungs and it is shown as a positive trace. So that is the role of entidal capnography in resuscitation. Now, as uh, Rakesh sir said, this is not just uh, doing some, some things in the proper order. It's all so involved, it's a team effort. It also in, it involves the quality assurance. So CCLS in, involves quality assurance as well. So how do you assess, the, how do the team leader assess the quality of CCLS, especially regarding ventilation? I'm not talking, I'm not talking about everything, but regarding the ventilation, quality of ventilation. So you do not, anyway, Ventilation, airway and ventilation in general takes a backseat when compared to chest compression. So do not unnecessarily interrupt chest compression for securing the airway. And do not hyperventilate. Okay, you have a definite airway. Still, you do not hyperventilate. And end point for ventilation is visible chest wise, normal tidal volume. So these are the uh, few of the points where the team leader looks as far as the quality of ventilation and the airway management is concerned in the CCLS. Some situations where uh, you do not know what to do. A patient with difficult air, what are, and you are doing CCLS. What are you supposed to do? 
chest compression should never be stopped for the airway assessment or management okay if there it's a difficult airway fine continue chest compression continue with bag and mask ventilation combined with chest compression till the expert help arrives so do not stop chest compression that is the take home message and if the sufficient expertise is there you can put in a supraglottic airway device or even a endotracheal tube but uh, do not waste time for looking and assessing a difficult area. You continue with chest compression. If possible, you put a supraglottic airway device. If possible, you can intubate, but do not waste time. In cannot ventilate, cannot intubate situations. So high flow oxygen through a face mask is advised and continue with compression only life supports. And if if possible, is because it's a hospital. Surgical cricothyroidomy, thyroidotomy can be life saving. So, coming to the point of synchronizing with chest compression. Initial, just, initially, what we learned in BCLS was set up initially when respiration alone is in arrest, we give one breath every five seconds. Now, when the respiration and the cardiac arrest is there, you give 30 chest compression along with two rescue breaths. So in a, in a synchronized manner. So do we need to continue that synchronization everywhere once the airway, advanced airway spreads? For example, you already patient is intubated. Then synchronization is not required and the chest compression can continue in its, its own rhythm at 120 compressions per minute and rescue breaths at one breath every six seconds in its own rhythm. Do it need not be synchronized. And airway management during resuscitation, you should remember that the goal is to ensure a patent airway and oxygenation. And in CCLS also, the priority is CAB, circulation, airway, and breathing. So circulation takes the priority first. So chest compression should not either should either not be interrupted at all or if at all interrupted less than 10 seconds during airway management that is the recommendation now coming to the summarizing to the key points so while cpr is going advanced airway is not a priority it may compromise compression of chest so that is very important so you do not should not waste time if especially if you are not an expert and you cannot intubate or uh, control the airway quickly. So there, the chest compression takes priority. You can manage your airway and breathing with simple maneuvers and adjuncts, or even a supraglottic airway device. You need not think about intubation first, even though it is the gold standard. Even though you have, the third point is, the respiratory rate with even an advanced airway should not be more than 10 per minute. So in order to avoid excessive inflation, so your uh, CCLS may be less effective if you overinflate the lungs. And once you have ach achieved uh, restoration of spontaneous circulation, advanced airway is mandatory for further care. So thank you. Thank you all. We will meet again on Sunday. Thank you once again. Okay, uh, good evening all and uh, thank you uh, ISM Alapuram and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the IMA Pindalmana for giving me an opportunity to speak and uh, bring about the IRC uh, Federation guidelines. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, the uh, about interosseous cannulation that is the interosseous uh, access. Uh, so, as you all know, uh, like uh, this is one of the emergency route of administration of drug in cardiac arrest, the other being intravenous, which, is, which all of you are familiar with. Uh, the one thing what you have to know is that whatever you give through the intravenous can also be given through the interosseous and the dosage of the drugs what you give are the same as the intravenous. And the third, third route is endotracheal. Here you will have to know that endotracheal is the third emergency route of administration of drug and only few drugs, uh, namely 
uh, adrenaline, uh, atropine, lignocaine, naloxone, vasopressin. These are the drugs which can be given through endotracheal uh, route. And the, the, the dosage will be two and a half to three times the normal. So uh, these three are the, uh, are the emergency route of administration of the drugs. And I'll be talking on intraocious access. So as you all know, these are included in all the resuscitation guidelines and it is, uh, you are uh, accessing the bone marrow cavity and this, this can be done for all ages. And this is an alternative to peripheral IV access. This was the situation earlier. Now the, what the ILCOR scientific committee has come out with is the outcome is much better uh, when you are using IV access. And so it is, uh, IV androsis is not considered as equal to uh, uh, IV access. Only when IV access is not possible, then you are going for androsis. So, so that is a change. And as I told you, you can give any, any drugs, you can give emergency medical injections, you can uh, do, give fluids, uh, <clears throat> you can resuscitate, you can give blood, blood products, and you can do blood, blood sampling and uh, the pharmaceutical actions and the drug delivery, these are similar to intravenous. Uh, as I told you, the, uh, the dosage is, are equal. And it is very quick to perform easy and an effective mode of uh, administration of drug. And it can be kept only for 24 hours compared to uh, intravenous, you can keep it for 48 to uh, 72 hours. The interosseous uh, access, the indication, as I told you, it is difficult or fail IV access and uh, life-threatening emergency situation when there is a limited vascular access that is in obesity and pre-hospital care. When you are taking the patient and it's uh, difficult to put an IV, may not be very uh, trained also people and also in a moving ambulance. So uh, it is that easy to put it if you master in that. So in process access, it can be done manually. That's the needle, what you are seeing now. And also by using a drill, that is easy in process technique. Now that's, that is the needle, that is the GEMCG needle. And uh, this is uh, invented by an Iranian uh, uh, physician uh, named uh, uh, GEMCG. And this, is, this can be used for bone marrow biopsy. So what I will show you is a a small clipping uh, on uh, uh, how you are inserting the needle. And this is uh, done for the bone biopsy within our hospital. So this is a rotatory movement. What do you see? So you are uh, putting pressure uh, force and you are giving a rotatory movement. And uh, what is the end point of this? So the end point uh, of this is uh, there will be a loss of resistance and there will be a free flow of marrow. So any, any, uh, if you get like this, you can connect to an IV and see, and uh, uh, you can aspirate, and then there will be a free flow of uh, fluid if you have connected. So, so that's how uh, you do the, uh, you do uh, intraocious access uh, when, you're, when you're using manually with a needle. So this is another thing what you see is a drill. You can see a drill here and there are needles and there are different colored needles and this yellow one, what do you see is, the, is for the large adult. So you can see the, on the needle, uh, <clears throat> there are calibrations uh, and uh, this all each uh, one centimeter calibration. Here you are seeing a smaller one. So when you are a large adult, you need to go in more. So that's the, uh, 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 that's the drill and, uh, uh, and that's the needle. And uh, here you're not applying any force and you're using it. So this can be done automatically. So after that, you can, uh, you can fix, uh, fix it and uh, start the fluids or the drugs, what you have to do. Now, what, uh, what are the sites? So that is a commonest site. Commonest site is proximal tibia. Yeah, this, uh, what you're seeing in this picture, uh, you have the you have the tibial tuberosity, and then uh, two to centimeter below that and meet to that. This is the commonest site for, uh, uh, for the intraocious axis. The second being uh, other thing is the distal tibia proximal to the medial malleolus, the distal femur, humerus head, sternum and iliac crest. So these are the commonest sites. For 
and complications is the infection. You are, but the, see, if you see the rate is much low, uh, one of the complications is osteomyelitis, then extravasation, subcutaneous abscess can also occur, and also the leakage also can occur so, uh, from the side. So these are the complications what we have. And contraindication is the target fracture in the ta target bone of insertion, previous surgery involving the knee replacements. We have uh, done a knee replacement going there at uh, below that and doing also should not be entertained an infection or a burn at the insertion site and osteomyelitis of the, in the targeted bone of previous failed interosseous uh, access within 24 hours and inability to locate landmark. So these are the uh, uh, commonest contraindications. And uh, uh, see, interosseous is, is a second route of administration of the drug. In summary, it is a second route of administration of the drug. And it is easy to perform. You can use, use a drill or by manually, and you can use it for 24 hours. And whatever you give through the intravenous can be given through the uh, can, uh, can be given through the interosseous that i mean the drugs the fluid the blood blood products and the sampling thank you thank you very much uh, senior colleagues and friends i am dr binil isaac matthew working as a cardiac anesthesiologist in a jubilee mission medical college hospital the show Today we will discuss pharmacology of emergency drugs used during cardiac arrest. To resuscitate the cardiac arrest successfully, we should be familiar with the pharmacology of emergency drugs used during cardiac arrest and pre-arrest conditions. The frequently used emergency drugs are adrenaline, noradrenaline, atropine, amiodarone, lignocaine, adenosine, magnesium sulfate, and dopamine. We should be aware of the indications and dosage of the emergency drugs. Aim of today's discussion is to discuss only relevant pharmacology related to cardiac arrest and pre-arrest results. Epinephrine or adrenaline is an inotropic vasopressor which stimulates alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. It has positive inotropic and chronotropic effects. What do you mean by positive inotropic effect? Positive inotropic effect means it increases contractility. And positive chronotropic effect means it increases heart rate. Epinephrine also increases systemic vascular resistance and blood pressure. It increases automaticity. Automaticity is the property of cardiac cells to generate spontaneous action potentials. Adrenaline increases cerebral blood flow, coronary blood flow and myocardial oxygen requirements. Indications of adrenaline are uh, cardiac arrest, ventricular fibrillation, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, asystole, pulseless electrical activity, symptomatic bradycardia after atropine, severe hypotension which is not responding to vasopressors. Then in uh, anaphylaxis and severe allergic reactions, the adrenaline is used along with fluid resuscitation, corticosteroids, and antihistamines. In cardiac arrest, the dose of adrenaline is 1 mg through intravenous or intraosseous route, and uh, it is repeated every 3 to 5 minutes. To make uh, 1 in 10,000 solution of adrenaline, 1 mg adrenaline should be diluted in 10 ml of normal saline. Follow each peripheral intravenous administration with a 20 ml of uh, IV saline flush and uh, elevate the extremity above the level of heart for 10 to 20 seconds. After restoration of the spontaneous circulation, the dose of adrenaline will be changed. 
the dose of adrenaline for continuous infusion rate is 0.1 to 0.5 microgram per kg per minute so we can adjust the dose depend on the patient's response adult endotracheal dose of adrenaline is 2 to 2.5 mg and it is diluted in 10 ml of normal saline noradrenaline also known as norepinephrine is a inotrop and vasopressin noradrenaline is naturally occurring catecholamine noradrenaline stimulates alpha and beta 1 receptors in the sympathetic nervous system and this stimulation causes peripheral renal splenic and pulmonary vasoconstriction beta 1 stimulation increases myocardial contractility uh, with less tachycardia produced than with the adrenaline. Coming to dose of noradrenaline, uh, dose is 0.05 to 1 microgram per kg per minute by infusion and it can be titrated depend upon the patient's requirement. Indications of uh, noradrenaline are septic shock, anaphylaxis with liable BP, unresponsive to adrenaline, hypotension unresponsive to fluid resuscitation, cardiogenic shock unresponsive to other ionotropes, maintenance of adequate blood pressure in the presence of hypotension associated with brainstem death, and a hypertensive agent of choice in the management of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Contraindications of uh, noradrenaline are hypovolemia, patients taking uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors or within 14 days of uh, such treatment of MAO inhibitors, mesenteric or peripheral vascular thrombosis and severe peripheral vascular disease. Weaning of noradrenaline should be by gradual tapering of the dose and uh, it should not be a sudden withdrawal because sudden withdrawal can cause hypotension. Adverse effects and complications of noradrenaline are tachycardia, dysrhythmias, hypertension, exacerbation of myocardial ischemia. It can cause tissue necrosis if extravasation occurs. Uh, noradrenaline can cause reduced blood flow to non-vital tissues, especially the skin and gut. It may cause renal vasoconstriction and can uh, decrease renal blood flow. Atropine is an anticholinergic agent and it blocks action of acetylcholine at parasympathetic sites in smooth muscle, secretory glands and central nervous system. Atropin increases heart rate and cardiac output. Dose of atropin is 0.5 mg every 3 to 5 minutes for symptomatic bradycardia. And the maximum dose of atropin is 3 mg or 6 doses. 2 to 3 mg atropin is full vagolytic dose in most of the patients. Atropin is the first drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardia. It may be beneficial for AV nodal block. In organophosphate poisoning, large doses of atropin may be required. So one should keep in mind that atropin is not indicated for pulseless electrical activity and acetone. Atropin increases myocardial oxygen demand. So it should be used with caution in myocardial ischemia and hypoxia. It is not effective for type 2 second degree or a new third degree heart block. Rather, rather it may slow down the rhythm. Uh, doses less than 0.5 mg can paradoxically slow down the heart rate. Amiodrone is a class 3 antiarrhythmic. It prolongs the cardiac action potential and the refractory period of atrial 
nodal and ventricular tissues. It has effects on sodium, potassium and calcium channels as well as alpha, beta adrenergic blocking properties. Amiodarone increases coronary blood flow, decreases cardiac oxygen requirements and suppresses ectopic pacemakers. So amiodarone is used to treat severe tachyarrhythmias. Amiodrone 300 mg is diluted in 30 ml normal saline and administered as intravenous slow bolus. It can be followed with one dose of uh, 150 mg after 3 to 5 minutes if required. So in life threatening arrhythmias, 150 mg of amiodrone can be repeated over 10 minutes. If required, it can repeat as needed. Maximum dose of amiodrone is 2.2 gram in 24 hours. Indications of amiodrone are life-threatening dysrhythmias, ventricular fibrillation, pulse SVT and responsive to shock, CPR and vasopressors, uh, and recurrent hemodynamically unstable VT. Adverse effect of amiodrone are bradycardia, heart block, hypotension, excessive prolongation of QT interval that means more than 0.6 seconds. It potentiates the effects of uh, warfarin, calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Long term administration of amiodrone may cause photosensitivity, hyper or hypothyroidism, lung fibrosis, prolonged PT and corneal deposits. Lignocaine may be considered as an alternative to amiodrone for persistent arrhythmias like ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VT. Bolus dose of lignocaine is 1 to 1.5 mg per kg intravenous or intravenous. It can be given as infusion 1 to 4 mg per minute after the bolus dose. Adenosine is an antiarrhythmic agent and it slows impulse formation of sinoatrial node. Adenosine slows conduction time through the atrioventricular node. It can interrupt reentry pathways through the atrioventricular node. And adenosine is also a good coronary vasodilator. It has an immediate onset of action and peak action is after 10 seconds. It has a short duration of action of 10 to 30 seconds. Adenosine is to be administered by a rapid bolus within 2 seconds, followed by a rapid 20 ml saline flush. Preferred to have two prefilled syringes attached with two way valve. First dose of adenosine is 6 mg rapid peripheral IV bolus or 3 mg if, ad if administered by central venous axis. If the first dose is ineffective but well and well tolerated, uh, we can consider uh, after 2 minutes we can consider uh, administering ad uh, adenosine 12 mg rapid peripheral IV bolus or 6 mg uh, if administered by central venous axis as second dose. Adenosine can be used for a rapid conversion of paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia to a normal sinus rhythm, including those associated with accessory bypass tracts, that means Wolf WP W syndromes. It does not convert atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or ventricular tachycardia. It can be used for diagnostic purpose also as an aid to differential diagnosis of narrow or broad complex tachycardia due to the slowing of atrioventricular conduction which makes atrial activity more visible uh, on ECGs. Contraindications of adenosine are hypersensitivity to adenosine, second or third degree heart block, sinus node dysfunction such as uh, sick sinus syndrome or symptomatic bradycardia, Suspected cases of uh, bronchoconstriction or bronchospastic lung disease like um, bronchial asthma 
and severe hypotension. Coming to side effects of adenosine, it resolves rapidly on stopping the treatment due to the drug's short duration of action. So the patient should be explained possible adverse effects before administration. Ensure patient understands that these effects will be short-lived. Common side effects of adenosine are flushing, dyspnea, chest pain, nausea or abdominal discomfort, headache, dizziness, apprehension, burning sensation, bradycardia, asystole, sinus pose and AV block. Infrequent adverse effects of uh, adenosine are transient arrhythmias, recurrence of supraventricular tachycardia, hypotension, tingling in abs or legs, metallic taste. And uh, rare adverse effects are bronchospasm and uh, the injection site reaction. Magnesium sulfate is a physiological calcium channel blocker. Indications of magnesium sulfate include cardiac arrest with torsades day points, polymorphic VT and digitalis toxicity. Hypomagnesemia can cause severe arrhythmias. Magnesium sulfate should be administered for the prevention and treatment of seizures in severe preeclampsia or eclampsia. In cardiac arrest due to ventricular tachycardia, torsades day points, 1 to 2 grams of magnesium sulfate in 10 ml of 5% dextrose or saline should be administered over 5 to 20 minutes through intravenous or intraocious routes. Torsades with pulse uh, or myocardial infarction with uh, hypomagnesemia should be treated with 1 to 2 grams of magnesium sulfate in 50 to 100 ml of 5% dextrose over 5 minutes to 60 minutes through intravenous or intraocious route followed by 0.5 to 1 gram per hour infusion. The side effects of uh, magnesium sulfate are flushing, sweating, mild decrease in heart rate and blood pressure. Indications of dopamine infusion are hypotension and symptomatic bradycardia after atropine. It should be administered as infusion at the rate of 2 to 20 microgram per kg per minute. Dopamine can be titrated as per the requirement and it should be tapered slowly. So, summarizing the drugs for bolus doses are adrenaline, amiodarone, atropine, adenosine, lignocaine and magnesium sulfate. And the drugs for infusion are adrenaline, amiodarone, atropine, adenosine, lignocaine, magnesium sulfate and dopamine. So you should keep in mind that some of the drugs are same for bolus doses, uh, bolus doses, uh, doses and um, infusions. But at the same time, the doses are different for bolus and infusions. The take home message is in cardiac arrest situations, follow each peripheral intravenous or intraocious and administration of bolus doses of injections with a 20 ml of saline flush and elevate the extremity above the level of heart for 10 to 20 seconds. If the pulses are present, always go for, always administer slow IV or intraocious infusions. So, if the pulses are there, go for infusions. If pulse is not present, go for boluses. Thank you.
the synchronized cardio version, you deliver a shock synchronized to the R wave of the ECG being monitored in wave sector one. You can monitor and perform a synchronized cardio version through the multifunction electrode pads or external paddles. Or you may choose to monitor the ECG through monitoring electrodes connected to a three, five, or 10 lead ECG cable with the energy delivered through the pads or paddles. In this case, we'll assume we have prepared for both monitoring and synchronized cardio version using the multifunction electrode pads and have a clear signal and large QRS complex. With the therapy knob in the monitor position, press the sync button to activate the sync function. This message appears. Confirm that the sync marker appears with each R wave. Turn the therapy knob to the desired energy level setting. Press the charge button on the MRX. Make sure no one is touching the patient or anything connected to the patient. Press and hold the shock button on the MRX. A shock delivers on the next detected R wave. You can deliver additional synchronized shocks simply by pressing the charge and shock buttons again. Disabling the sync function is as easy as pressing the sync button. Okay, we now have a patient who is in a second degree heart block. This patient, as you can see, has a heart rate of 30. They still have a pulse, but they're symptomatic, and so we want to treat them. We've tried some atropine on this patient. However, it doesn't seem, the patient doesn't seem to be responding to the medication. So we want to uh, think about doing some cardiac pacing on this patient. And um, always with pacing, you always want to remember it's a very painful process for your patient. So if you have time to get an IV inserted, and give them some uh, medication like some Versed or Valium, something like that to kind of sedate them. That's a really great idea. Okay, so here again, we have placed the uh, pads on our patient so that we can um, pace, and you also will need your ECG leads on the chest as well. Okay, so to run the pacer, very easy. You see that the bottom section of the uh, defibrillator says pacer and there's a series of, of a couple buttons underneath that that we're going to use to um, turn the pacer on so go ahead and let's turn the pacer on okay and notice we have a rate that comes up at 60 that's default on this machine if we want to increase that rate and many places go up to about a rate of 70 to 80 to pace we're going to go to 80 and then you want to increase the current the button below. So go ahead and let's start increasing our current. And what you're looking for is a pacer spike to appear. And then what we, there are some pacer spikes and now what we're looking to see is we want to see a corresponding QRS complex after that pacer spike on each spike. We're going to keep increasing that current until we see a pacer spike followed by a QRS complex and this is what they refer to as capture okay now we would want to check to see if our patient had a pulse with that and um, yes they do have a pulse we'd want to check in the femoral artery not the carotid artery because sometimes the muscle can spasm and um, lead you to misbelieve so we're going to go up 10 more uh, after we've uh, reached capture and there we are. We are pacing this patient. Now this is a transcutaneous pacing. It is a temporary thing and you would want to take your patient to the cath lab to have a transvenous pacer uh, placed. So here again your cardiologist would be in charge of that. But you've got the patient um, stabilized at this point. You'd want to check their blood pressure and um, prepare them for transport. Okay, very good. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah.
Am I audible, sir? My screen is visible. Yeah, very, okay. very much, very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction, and I'm thankful to Dr. Chakra Rao, Dr. Rashesh Devan, and Dr. Paul for inviting me for this talk on Brady Arithmia Algorithm. Uh, so, basic uh, main objective of my talk will be: when, as a CCLS provider or a clinician, we encounter the Brady Arithmias, uh, we must understand and uh, identify the common causes. Uh, then how we identify and what is the clinical significance if a patient is having bradyarrhythmias and how do we manage as a CCLS provider that at an initial management. So when we encounter as a CCLS provider, this can be a situation in a pre-arrest condition because uh, a patient who is admitted in your ward um, are in the ICU and suddenly you found that the, there are some ECG changes and patient is developing a bradyarrhythmia or you have done a successful resuscitation of a patient, and once there is a return of a spontaneous circulation, is still ECG showing some bradyarrhythmia and you have to identify as a CCLS provider. Or a patient may also present in the emergency department with certain signs and symptoms, and when you examine them, the patient, you find that there is a bradyarrhythmia. So what exactly is the bradycardia? By definition, we know when the heart rate goes below 60, this is called as bradycardia. But actually, a patient becomes symptomatic only when the heart rate goes below 50. Up to this point, usually patients do not present with the symptom. But we must remember that the normal variation uh, in the heart rate is there, especially for the trained athletes where the bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia is well tolerated. Or even a patient is on media blocker therapy who can have the heart rate of less than 50 and they remain stable. This is very important to understand that what happens in bradycardia that leads to problem to a patient, that creates some certain symptoms in the patient. So when there is a bradycardia, because of some pathological condition, this leads to a decrease in the cardiac output, which leads to hypotension, and this hypotension decreases the cardiac output and decreases the tissue perfusion. And this hypoperfusion of the various vital organs leads to a symptom uh, development in the bradyarrhythmia patient. So we can understand with this diagram, the, sorry, the heart rate has gone down. The stroke volume tries to compensate to maintain the cardiac output, but the stroke volume does not increase as the heart rate goes down in the, that much proportion. So there is a drop in the cardiac output. So effective cardiac output decreases. That's why patients become symptomatic. What are the different types of bradyarrhythmia? We must understand. Sinus bradyarrhythmia, which means the rhythm is same, normal, like a normal sinus rhythm, only thing is the heart rate has gone below 60. The second uh, class, the, the classification, the second one is the sinus node dysfunction. When the sinus node, which is actually a natural pacemaker, where the generation of the electrical activity is not taking place or it is delayed, so that's called a sinus node dysfunction and that is leading to development of the uh, pacemaker activity from some other thing. And third important, as a CCLS provider, one important um, component is the AV block, which can be a first degree, second degree, um, which is morbid type 1, or we call it as Wenke Bax phenomena, or morbid type 2. These two first and seconds are an incomplete heart block, or there can be a complete heart block, that's a third degree heart block. We are well aware that this is the sinus bradycardia. We can see that T wave is present, QRS complex is present. It means atrial depolarization and repolarization is taking place, and uh, um, the, all the waves are conducting very well. So PQRS relation is one is to one, the, but the rate is less than 60 beats per minute. Sinus node dysfunction, which is caused by the absent pacemaker activity at the sinus node, so that the other areas starts working as a pacemaker, like atria, AV junction, that's we call it as junctional rhythm, or even the ventricle starts depolarization, that means we can have a wide QRS complex. So depending upon from where it is generating, we call it as atrial escape, uh, where there can be a late P wave or P wave morphology may be different, or there can be junctional escape, where the narrow complex uh, uh, will be there with a retrograde P wave or absent P wave, and idioventricular escape when, they, when there is a wide QRS complex, but usually the idioventricular rhythms are 30 to 40 beats per minute. Usually these are non-perfusing rhythms. Now coming on the different blocks, first degree, second degree, 
second degree type 1, type 2, and complete heart block. As a CCLS provider, we must understand to that how to differentiate these blocks. This is very important because if, uh, once you identify the blocks, then only you can decide that what exactly is happening. So first degree AV block, we all know. All the P waves are followed by QRS complex. The only abnormality is the PR interval is prolonged. So normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. When it is more than 0.2 seconds, we call it as first degree AV block. So usually there is no problem in identifying the first degree AV block. Now, there can be difficulty in identifying the second degree type 1, second degree type 2, and complete heart block. To differentiate between these uh, three, uh, three uh, blocks, second degree type 1, second degree type 2, and complete heart block, we have to look for three things. First thing, when we call it as a block, when P waves are more than QRS. So all P waves are not leading to a generation of QRS. Now, for differentiating between these three, we look at RR interval. You can see in this one, we look at RR interval. If the RR interval is same, like this, this is none other than the complete heart block. So now we are left with these two, second degree type one and second degree type two block. To differentiate between these two, we look at PR interval. If the PR interval is fixed, you can see here, PR interval is fixed. You can see PR interval is fixed. This is second degree type 2 block. And if there is a prolonged PR interval, there is a prolongation of PR interval followed by a drop beat. You can see this one. This is what we call it as Wenke Bax phenomena. This is second degree type 1 block. So this is how we differentiate the three types of block. So why, what happens when these patients present to us? Usually patient comes with certain symptoms. Because there is a possibility that this bradycardia is either creating some symptoms in the patient or there is some other underlying cause and which is causing actually a problem. This is not the bradycardia which has happened because of this underlying disease which is causing the symptoms. So patient usually presents with certain symptoms in the form of patient may complain dizziness, giddiness, lightheadedness or patient can complain that there are certain syncopal attacks or patient is can say that there is a, some missed beats or I am having a chest discomfort. So these are the symptoms which a patient can present when a we come across with a patient with a bradyarrhea. When we examine these patients, then we can see that on examination that these patients are hypotensive. Hypotensive means when the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 millimeter of mercury and there are signs of shock means there is poor perfusion. You can see uh, that there is a uh, peripheries are cold, um, capillary filling time has increased, patient is having a cold sweats, and there is a uh, discoloration of the uh, peripheral skin. So that's a sign of shock. If these are present, or there is acute heart failure, when you auscultate these patients, they have the bilateral basal crepitations, or there is a raised uh, uh, JVP. If these are present, our patient is having an acutely altered mental status. On one occasion, you see also that the patient is drowsy, our patient is irritable. So if there is an acute change in the mental status of the patient, it means the signs are present. And this is very important for us here to remember that if only symptoms are present and when you examine, patient is not having sign, it means this patient is stable. But if any of these signs are present in a patient with a bradyarrhythmia, it means that patient is unstable and needs immediate attention. And if not treated aggressively and quickly, patient can deteriorate and patient may develop cardiac. So if we follow a stepwise approach in a patient who is adult with a bradyarrhythmia, so patient present to us with the symptoms, we evaluate the patient, and if only signs are present, it, uh, symptoms are present, it means patient is stable. But if the signs are also, uh, we can examine and we found that there are signs, patient is unstable. So if the patient is stable, we have a time. But don't leave this patient. This patient needs to be monitored uh, regularly, continuously, and get a 12 DCG done and look for an expert consultation. But at any point of time, if this patient becomes unstable, 
Patient should be supported with oxygen. Breathing should be assisted as appropriate if the patient requires only oxygen, our patient is requiring non-invasive ventilation, our patient is requiring the intubation, the mechanical ventilation. So all these uh, should be supported accordingly. Pharmacologically, our electrical therapies are required depending upon what kind of a cardiorrhythmia patient is having. If time permits, we can get a 12 day ECG, but if the patient is unstable, then do not waste time for doing an ECG. Quickly treat this patient either with electrical therapy or with a pharmacological therapy and look for the cause because what is important that treating the underlying cause is always important and a priority. At this point of time, I would like to remind you that the most common cause in pediatric population of bradycardia is hypoxemia. So giving oxygen will be very vital, especially in the pediatric patients. And the mnemonics uh, uh, in CCLS, we call it as hit the target. So first is the hypoxia, acidosis, tension, pneumothorax, toxins, hypovolemia. The treatment of the cause is equally important along with the treating a bradyarrhythmia situation. So all causes, possible causes, which are reversible, should be thought and uh, these patients should be treated aggressively. So how to approach these patients? <clears throat> Quickly identify. When the symptoms were, uh, when the onset of these symptoms has happened. So, this will help you by taking history, quick history, it will guide you that what can be the possible cause. Because if it is the acute symptoms, it is possible that the patient is having either the acute coronary event or patient is having some toxins, hypoglycemia. And if it is a prolonged one, then it means that there is some other underlying problem this we can evaluate. Do a focused examination because you want to evaluate that whether this patient is stable or unstable. And by doing an examination, you can look for an underlying cause, which is treating the underlying cause is always a priority. And if time permits, a relevant investigation, not all investigation, but the relevant investigation, which can uh, make your diagnosis confirm, uh, like uh, looking at the potassium or looking at the metabolic acidosis will be crucial at this stage for confirmation of your diagnosis. So how do we manage this? The first thing, besides airway breathing, uh, means supporting with oxygen or intubating and mechanically ventilating, the drug required for managing the bradyarrhythmia is a first line drug is a atropine 0.6 milligram intravenously. We can give few doses of atropine, but a maximum dose three milligram, uh, we should not exceed the dose of three milligrams. If patient is not responding, we have we can start with the adrenal infusion at 0.1 to 0.5 microgram per kg per minute or dopamine 5 to 20 microgram per kg per minute. Isoprotenol means isoprenally can be given at the 20 to 60 microgram as a bolus followed by an infusion of 1 to 20 microgram per minute. But one should be very, very careful that a patient who is having acute coronary event, there can be ischemic chest discomfort, our patient can have pain, and a uh, patient can complain uneasy. In cases of acute infeopal MI, our second degree and third degree heart block, who, where we do not have immediate ECT available, and the patient is not responding to atropine, usually these patients will not respond to atropine. We can use one dose of aminophylline 250 milligram. In cases of drug toxicity, like in cases of uh, calcium uh, channel blockers or beta blockers, we can use the glucagon or high dose of insulin and calcium chloride in cases of calcium channel blocker toxicity. Uh, Dr. Sasidharan has already described about the transcriptive spacing. So, but just uh, quickly, we can uh, go through it that because it's so very important that we should know how to operate this. So, whenever we talk about the transcriptive spacing, the component, what we uh, needed is a monitor, where, which has the TCP facility along with the monitor display monitor. And we should have a pad uh, disposable pads with the cable. There can be two modes. Whenever we talk about the transcutaneous spacer, there are two modes, asynchronous mode and demand. Asynchronous mode means irrespective of the patient's intrinsic heart rate, the pacemaker will continuously keep firing at a rate which you have set. Demand mode is that patient is having a, say for example, a 70 um, heart rate of 70 beats per minute, but we are expecting that the patient is having some inferior wall MI or some reason that the patient can have a sudden bradycardia. So we set the rate lower than the actual rate of the patient. 
So if the heart rate goes below down, below this, uh, the set rate, the pacemaker will start work. If the heart rate remains higher than that, pacemaker will not work. Three things are very, very important for us to know that first is the mode, second is the rate, and third is the current down. Rate, all these uh, transcutaneous pacer have a rate range of 30 to 180, but usually we keep the rate around within the physiological range, 80 to 100. Current output, again, because you are placing a pads over the chest and there is electrical activity which is stimulating the heart. So we start with a current of lower current output and we keep increasing it because keeping, um, uh, you start with a lower current and you look for a capture. Capture, there are two kinds of a capture. One is electrical capture and second is mechanical capture. What does electrical capture means? That there is always, whenever you start a pacing, there is a spike on the uh, ECG on the monitor. But this is not sufficient because this is only electrical, it is generating some certain electrical activity, but this is actually not producing any contraction in the myocardium. And what is your target? Your target is that every phase B should produce a contraction in the myocardium so that you produce the heart rate along with the blood pressure that will improve the hemodynamics. So how will you understand it? One is the white, once you are pacing a ventricle, there should always be a white QR spot. And when you feel the pulse of this patient, with every pacemaker beat, you will find that there is a pulse is present. Patient will start showing hemodynamic improvement, means patient's perfusion will start improving. However, we should remember that this transcutaneous pacing is always a painful procedure because electrical current is passing through the uh, skin uh, to the myocardium. So we cannot continue it for a very long time. And, but remember, transvenous, uh, whenever uh, we have placed a patient on transcutaneous pacing, we should call an expert for transvenous pacing. So this is, um, you can see the device. It is a combo device with a transcutaneous pacer facility. Combo device means any device which is having a AED defibrillator along with the transcutaneous pacer. So here, what are the steps we follow? We attach the pad. You can see this is a pad, disposable pad, and the placement of the pad has been shown on these diagrams. Then we select the mode by turning this knob, and we select the rate, how much rate we want to set, and we select the current output. We start with the lower current, and we keep escalating till the time we get a mechanical capture. We'll just see a video. You can see this, the heart rate patient is having a second degree type of block. And now we have placed the pads on the patient's bare chest. It is connected. And now we are turning towards the demand pacing. You can see this is fine. This is the electrical capture, but it is actually not pacing. Now we have increased the rate to 100. Now we are increasing the current. You can see this 35, 40, 50, no pacing. On 60, is still no pacing. We have further because there is no white QRS complex. Now you can see this is the generation of a white QRS complex at the rate of 100 beats per minute. You can see the heart rate is increasing and is reaching to 100. So this is actually a pacing which is required. Um, this is the current which is required to pace this patient. So there are certain condition which needs special attention and we should remember that in these condition, even the patient remains stable, patient is still stable, we should arrange the transcutaneous pacer. And this is if a patient had any history of recent AC stone. So these patients are having a high tendency to develop a complete heart block or second degree type 2 block. Are any patients who is having a second degree type 2 block or complete heart block, or there is an alternating bundle branch block? Means you found that sometime it's a right bundle branch block. After some time, you got an ECG done. Uh, patient is having a left bundle branch block. So this means its patient is a, the most commonly having an acute coronary event. So in all these conditions, keep a standby pacing, even a patient seems to be stable because these patients usually do not respond to the atrophy. What is important here for us to remember that treat this underlying cause besides treating the bradyarrhythmia. So ensure that the patient temperature is normal. If patient is having acute coronary event, this can be a candidate for percutaneous coronary intervention. So, so we should be ready to send these patients to a cath lab or may need thrombolysis depending upon the time frame when we have received this patient, ensure that adequate oxygenation is being done. 
if there is a hypo or hyperkalemia, a correction of the potassium has to be done. Any patient is having a metabolic acidosis should be corrected. And if we are suspecting any toxicity, uh, we should address the toxicity so that we can improve the heart rate. So to conclude, what is important that bradyarrhythmia, which is, we may encounter in the pre-periarrest situation. Periarrest means pre-arrest, during arrest and post-arrest. Our patient may have some new onset and patient can present in the ward itself or in the emergency department. Symptomatic bradyarrhythmia should be assessed for two things. One, whether the patient is stable or unstable. To differentiate between stable and unstable, we have to look for signs. If signs are present, it means patient is unstable. If signs are not present, only symptoms are there, it means patient is stable. And we should look for an underlying cause because treating underlying cause is always a priority. Immediately, patient these unstable patients should be managed, airway, breathing, and circulation. So oxygenation, adequate oxygenation, management of airway depending upon the how the patient is, and we need a pharmacological intervention. Transcutaneous pacer is a life-saving procedure for those patients who are unresponsive to the medical treatment and treat the underlying cause appropriately. There are certain conditions, as I said, secondary type 2, complete heart block, or alternative bundle branch block, where you need a standby pacing in spite of that patient is still stable. Thank you very much. I'll be happy if you have any questions to answer. Hello? Yes. Yes, yes sir, please, sir. Uh, my slides are visible? Yes. Yes, dear. Okay. Uh, uh, like, uh, sorry for the time uh, delay uh, for all the people who are listening. And uh, there are hardly two more topics, and uh, we'll be finishing uh, in less than half an hour. Uh, these two topics, and uh, I will try to finish it uh, quickly. So, uh, uh, see, now you have heard about uh, bradyarrhythmias, and like bradyarrhythmia, tachyarrhythmias are also a uh, pre-arrest condition, if it is not intervened within the uh, within the stipulated time, uh, like they can go for a cardiac arrest. So you should uh, have the knowledge, uh, the presence of mind, and uh, and the skill to manage these cases. So uh, tachyarrhythmia, you call tachyarrhythmia when the heart rate is more than 100 per minute. And when there are uh, uh, signs and symptoms due to uh, rapid heart rate, then you call them symptomatic tachycardia. Usually the heart rate will be more than 150 per minute. The key to manage these cases is to determine whether there is a pulse uh, is present or not. If it is present, then determine whether the patient is stable or unstable and provide treatment based on this uh, patient's rhythm and condition. So the common rhythms, what we have here is sinus tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, VT, monomorphic, polymorphic, and white complex tachycardia of uncertain type. So normal sinus rhythm, you all know that uh, the rate is 60 to 100 per minute. You will have a P, a QRS, and T all in very good shape. Uh, you call it sinus tachycardia when there is an increase in heart rate, more than 100. And, uh, and, and this may be due to, uh, due to the physiological conditions like pain, um, fever, where there is a compensatory increase in the heart rate. Then come, which is uh, commonly known uh, arrhythmia, that is atrial fibrillation, where the atria is fibrillating. You will find the classical fibrillatory waves uh, uh, where atria, there is no effective cardiac output. There will be uh, uh, the fibrillation of the heart. It is also known as quivering of the heart. So the pulse will be irregularly irregular and uh, you can have the classical fibrillatory waves. So that is atrial fibrillation. Then atrial flutter. Atrial flutter, the classical sore tooth appearance. You can see on the sore tooth appearance. And here, the ventricular rates, uh, atrial rates are much more than the ventricular rate. And it will be three to four times more than the uh, ventricular rate. So the classical description, sore tooth uh, uh, wave, that is uh, atrial flutter. Uh, 
supraventricular tachycardia you, know, you can see the rates are much higher it can go to 200 to 220 uh, will not be able to appreciate the p wave t wave etc the qrs is very narrow less than 0.1, uh, 0.12 seconds ventricular tachycardia you have monomorphic uh, ventricular tachycardia and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia monomorphic you can see it's all uniform and the wide complexes and polymorphic it is wide complexes but it is not uniform and it is irregular so that is polymorphic VT. And I put the ventricular fibrillation also. There is absolutely no morphology. There, there is no cardiac output. Uh, the heart is fibrillating and there is, uh, it's also called quivering. So no uh, cardiac output. And uh, most of you and all of you will be familiar about this, that what it needs is a shock. Asystole I put here, it is a flat line because some drugs which is given here, like, like adenosine, uh, can cause transient asystole. So if it, is, if it is not transient, if it is continued, then you will have to manage. Now, uh, coming to the algorithm proper, uh, uh, like your tachycardia, what you have to see is the, whether the symptoms and signs are present. Dr. Vivek has already mentioned about the signs and symptoms. So if you are, you have to see whether once there is a pulse, then you'll have to see whether it, the, these patients are having signs and symptoms. So if the signs and symptoms are not there, they are called stable. And if it is there, it is called unstable. So stable, what we have to do is uh, to see the QRS complex. If it is less than 0.12, you call them narrow complex. If, if it is more than that, you call them white complex. So in coming to the narrow complex, uh, you, you have to see whether the complexes are regular and irregular. So if it is regular, the, the, the commonest one is uh, supraventricular tachycardia. What you have to do is the vagal measures such as valsalva manure, carotid uh, massage. And 25% of the cases, uh, like it will be reverted. If it is not reverted, then the drug of choice is adenosine. Six milligram, you will have to give. You have to give very rapidly because the half-life is less than 10 seconds. So within two seconds, you should give this drug. And the repeat dose, if it is not reverted, has to be given after two minutes, that's 12 milligram. Now, if it is irregular, it is not, it doesn't come under the purview of a CCLS provider, then you'll have to call an expert because the patient is stable. QRS uh, wide, there also you have to see whether it's regular and irregular. Irregular, you can give one dose of adenosine, both, both for the diagnostic and treatment purpose. You give adenosine six milligram, if it is not uh, clear about it, then you give amidor on 150 milligram over 10 minutes. After that, you can start an infusion that is a slow infusion, one milligram per minute that comes to 60, uh, 60 milligram that into six hours, that is 360 milligram. So one milligram per minute, you will have to give. So if it is irregular, as I told you, you'll have to call an expert. Now, suppose the patient is unstable, then it is the only thing is cardioversion. And energy levels are also mentioned, which I'll come to you later. So this is a machine, uh, <clears throat> what we have in our hospital. It has got uh, both AED, defibrillator, a provision for pacing, a provision for cardio, uh, cardioversion. So if you turn to the left, it's AED. If you turn to the right, it goes to the defibrillator or uh, say a cardioversion, etc. So when you know about the defibrillator, you should know about your defibrillator or whatever the machine you have. Whether it, the one thing what you have to you know is whether it is monophasic. What does monophasic means? It means the current flows in one direction, and it is biphasic also. Here the current flows in two directions. So what is the difference? If the current is flowing in two directions, that biphasic the the energy required to suppress the arrhythmia is lesser. So if it is biphasic, you have to give a lesser energy. And if it is a monophasic, because it uh, goes in only one direction, the current we have to uh, give is more. So by monophasic, it is more and biphasic, it is less. So synchronized question uses a, uses a sensor to deliver a shock. So where does it uh, synchronize? It, it synchronizes on the peak of the QRS mode once 
the sync button sync mode so what is the sync mode so what you can see is this is the sync mode if that sync mode is pressed if that sync mode is pressed then uh, it synchronizes there will be always a delay a de a delay in the delivery of shock when compared with the defibrillation because it has to analyze multiple complexes for synchronization so always one should know that there will be a delay delay in delivering the shock when compared to uh, defibrillation and all this will be a low energy shock see you have to give a low energy shock see uh, uh, we, uh, always with synchronization if it is not synchronized then it can go for uh, ventricular fibrillation so low energy shocks will also uh, will always have to be synchronized now the steps uh, quickly uh, dr sashidharan has already mentioned you remember this 3c consent crash cart and consider sedation you have to take the consent of the patient you have to tell him that we are going to give a shock it may be slightly painful then keep the crash cart ready because i told you like it can anyway sometimes go for ventricular fibrillation consider sedation you should always consider it's not that you will have to give it consider sedation because these these patients are already unstable and if you are giving a sedation it may deteriorate their sensorium and also hemodynamic parameters after that after the three c's you have to turn on the monitor so turn on the monitor that is that is the one you have to change it and uh, attach monitor lead for display of the rhythm so you can see the display of the rhythm then you have to position that the see pads it is already been mentioned and your posterior uh, you are putting on the, the right one below the clavicle uh, and the other one on the left side near the apex bit in the mid uh, axillary line so this is an anterior posterior uh, placement of the pads you have uh, 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 sorry it is the anterior lateral placement you have anterior posterior also so this is anterior lateral so you have put the pads then after that you press the sync button that is the sync button so once sync button is uh, pressed you will change uh, you will see the change here on the uh, r wave there will be one some spots pointers which is coming so look for the markers of the r wave so you can see the markers so markers here so that is uh, synchronization so once you press the sync button you will see that then you select the energy level so what are the energy levels if you are using a monophasic for atrial fibrillation is 200 if you are using biphasic atrial fibrillation is 120 to 200 mono monomorphic uh, vt it is both 100 joules like even if it is monophasic or biphasic it's 100 joules svt and flutter needs less current so it is 50 to 100 for both monophasic and biphasic and polymorphic vt if it is there you will have to defibrillate the patient so after uh, selecting the energy you will have to press the charge button after alerting the team members you have to alert the team members uh, so that uh, it will analyze properly so once charged uh, the press uh, the shock button after alerting so you have to press the shock button after telling them that i am going to shock and give the shock so immediately after giving the shock you check the monitor if the tachycardia persists repeat uh, repeat uh, giving cardiac version so always uh, what you see is this engage the sync bone after delivery of e shock so automatically the machine by default it goes to the uh, it go it goes to the non synchronized mode because any time as i told you like uh, sing, uh, once you give a synchronized shock it can go for a ventricular fibrillation so uh, once if you ventricular fibrillation you have to immediately defibrillate so if we, if, if if the sync button is engaged it will take time and you are delaying the so by default the machine goes to uh, goes to uh, uh, means uh, uh, non synchronized mode so every time but the, the message is every time you are going to give a synchronized shock you will have to press the sync mode so that is the shock uh, you have to deliver it's already been spoken and uh, uh, cardioversion it has been already mentioned also 
so what the the home uh, what take home message what you have is when you get a tachycardia with a pulse you have to see whether the symptoms are there or not e, these are the symptoms these are uh, symptoms and signs and the, if these are the uh, if these are not there you call them stable if it is stable it is mainly the pharmacological drugs you are going to give and if it's the unstable you are going to give the uh, cardioversion. So th that is the message what we have. And cardioversion, you should know how to give it, which has been already been explained by the previous speaker also. And I have also emphasized more on, on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for the patient hearing. Yeah, am, I, they, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Audible. Okay. Uh, senior, uh, senior faculty members of uh, Indian Association Council uh office isa office bearers national and state office bearers of uh, isa and ima malapuram a warm and uh, the members attending the ccl of schools a warm good evening to everyone and i thank the uh, office bearers and office bearers for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this program so i'll be dealing with the last but the vital topic the team dynamics so Moving on to the slides. So team dynamics, then effective resuscitation is a result of a good teamwork. The aim is to work as a team uh, with, while performing- Peter, high... can you expand it? I mean, said full in slides, so. Uh, yeah. Go to slideshow. You'll find that below, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's good. Okay. So uh, the aim is to work as a team uh, while performing high quality resuscitation skills with effective communication between the team leader and team members. So coming to the core concept of team dynamics, there are six core concepts. Uh, first one is uh, the specific task assignments with understanding team members' strengths and weaknesses. Second one is avoiding crosstalk and following a closed loop communication. Third one is uh, clear and directed delegation messages. Fourth one is uh, giving constructive inputs. Fifth one is mutual respect for team members. And the sixth concept is uh, debriefing. So we'll uh, go to the each core concept in detail. So uh, all rescuers on the team should be able to uh, respond quickly and effectively in an emergency situation. An effective multi-rescuer team dynamics help the victim, help give victim the best chance of survival after cardiac arrest. So the- uh, hey, but Please make it the full screen. That, uh, it's not I moving. Change the slide also. Uh, you, you, huh? Again, do the uh, slide sharing because the slides are not moving and it is not in the slideshow. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir, just a moment. Yeah. Yeah, it's moving. You can put slideshow. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so because uh, <clears throat> each second matters during a station attempt, it's important to define clear roles and responsibilities as soon as possible. And this is done according to each team member's skill level 
and when all members know their responsibilities clearly then only the team functions smoothly so i mean to the positions for uh, six person high performance team deepak sir you remove the slide so it may change it's not moving so now it is in the roles and responsibility banal now Just, sir ah uh, yeah now yes yeah. now uh, coming to the positions for a uh, six person high performance team surely this is uh, this picture shows uh, the positions of various team members if there are six team members in a high performance team including a team leader an ai manager a chess compressor one person dealing with the monitor and defibrillator one person dealing with the iv access iv bar io access and giving medication and the last one is a recorder time recorder coming to the uh, duties in detail every uh, association team must have a defined team leader team leader assigns roles to the team members makes treatment decisions provides feedback to the rest of the team as and when needed and he also assumes the responsibilities for roles which are not defined if the when uh, only five people are available the void is uh, covered by the team leader second person is a compressor compressor assesses the patient and one and when the arrest is confirmed without wasting time after activating the emergency system he starts chest compressions according to the protocol and the compressor has to rotate every 2 minutes or soon when he or she gets fatigued to maintain the quality of chest compression third person is the airway manager the manager opens the airway provides back mask ventilation at the rate of 2 uh, inhalations after each 30 compressions and he or she inserts airway adjuncts as and when appropriate the fourth person is the person dealing with the monitor or defibrillator he or she brings and operates the monitor or defibrillator and he places it in a position which will be clearly seen by the team member and most of the team and the fifth person uh is a person dealing with the intravenous or intravenous access and giving medications according to the instructions from the team leader the sixth person is a timer of the recorder uh, he or she records a time of interventions and medications and announces when they are next due the uh, recorder records the frequency and duration of interruptions in chest compressions to maintain the quality and uh, recorder communicates all these to the team leader and rest of the team so uh, before uh, assigning a role or assuming a role all team members should know their uh, limitations and the team leader should be aware of them as well and each team member uh, has to ask for assistance or help early before a situation gets worse because it will affect the final outcome of the patient after an cessation attempt so on to the second core concept till is a closed loop communication closed loop communication is used to prevent misunderstandings and treatment errors it, it consists of a sender the team leader giving the message the receiver repeating it back and the sender then confirming it was heard correctly i'll repeat it consists of a sender i should the team leader giving a message and the receiver the team member repeating it back and the sender the team leader confirming it was heard correctly for example if the team leader uh, gives an instruction uh, say to the iv uh, or io person uh, please load injection adrenaline 1 mg plus 20 ml saline flush and don't give until i give an order so the iv person has to revert Injection adrenaline one milligram uh, plus twenty ml normal saline flush loaded and kept ready and waiting for your orders. Then the team leader will say, "Okay, clear." So this is an example of a closed loop communication. All the communications uh, throughout the resuscitation effort has to be like this to avoid confusions. So what is the uh, role of a team leader in a closed loop communication? A team leader should call each member by their name. 
and make eye contact while giving an instruction and he your uh, team leader should not assign additional tasks to the team member until he is sure that the team member uh, understands the task already given instruction already given at the same time the team member confirms that you understand each task the team leader assigns you by verbally acknowledging the task and they have to tell the team leader when the task has been carried out so the third concept will be regarding clear messages clear messages help prevent misunderstandings and keep the every team member focused all team members should use a language which is clear and concise speak loudly enough to be heard well and they should speak in a tone that is calm as well as confident the fourth concept is uh, constructive intervention there may be instances when a team a team leader need to point out other members incorrect actions they should intervene in a tactful as well as a constructive manner without affecting the emotions or feelings of the team member because uh, the emotions can run very high during a resuscitation effort so and especially it is important when some member is about to make mistake on a drug dose or an intervention and anyone on the team should speak up to prevent someone else some other team member from performing a mistake regardless of the role the fifth concept is regarding mutual respect all team members should uh, display mutual respect respective of their level of training or expertise the team leader to uh, speak in a friendly as well as controlled voice and you should always avoid shouting or aggression to the team members the last concept is uh, regarding debriefing debriefing can occur immediately with the entire team or later with a team member and others according to the availability of time and it is an opportunity for the team to discuss how the resuscitation event went why the team took certain decision and discuss whether anything can be improved in future events and it is an opportunity for uh, continuing education quality improvement of the team and the processing of emotions after participation in a stressful event and the advantages of debriefing include they help individual team members to perform better in, in future events it helps in identifying the system strengths and deficiencies and uh, it helps improve patient survival after cardiac arrest so thank you everyone so we have uh, discussed the core concepts in detail